Good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. We have an amazing show for everybody today. What do we have, Crystal? Indeed, we do. A whole lot of things breaking yesterday and even into yesterday <laughs> evening. So uh, Dr. Fauci is officially announcing his retirement. I know. As head of uh, the NIH after a very long tenure. Um, so we will break all of that down for you. And also, we'll trip down memory lane from the, the Fauci oh time during coronavirus. Uh, we also have primaries today, especially so in the state of New York and Florida, uh, a lot going on, especially on the Democratic side in New York, including a very key bellwether uh, congressional race. It's a special election. Mm -hmm. One of the candidates on the Democratic side really focusing on abortion. On the Republican side, really focusing in on inflation. It's a swing seat. So interesting to see how that all shakes out. Big movement in the stock market yesterday. Um, you know, the analysts are like, this is anticipation of the Fed's meeting in Jackson Hole and concerns about what Fed Chair Jerome Powell is going to say. So we will tell you about that. Um, also, new details about the assassination of that Russian uh, intellectual, I guess you would call him, Dugan's daughter, mm -hmm. uh, and exactly what is going on there. And we have new details about the Trump Mar-a-Lago raid affidavit, new comments from the judge, new reporting that is coming out, new moves from the Trump team, all of of that, but we want to, to start with Dr. Fauci. That's right, pretty big uh, news that came out yesterday. Let's go ahead and put this up there on the screen. Fauci doing two exclusive interviews with the New York Times and the Washington Post to announce officially he will be stepping down in December to pursue, quote, his next chapter. So this is the man who has advised, as they say, seven presidents and spent more than 50 years at the National Institute of Health, seven resigning at the NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infection infectious diseases. He's 81 years old. The reason why this is a little bit strange is that Fauci had previously said, yeah, I am going to leave. But then he came out and he's like, no, 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 no. But I'll stay on until 2024. And now he's like, no, but I am actually going to leave this time. And it caught some people by surprise. We don't exactly know what the impetus for that was. Previously, he had committed to reigning all the way through the end of President Biden's, uh, the end of President Biden's at least first term. Now, in it, he says, as he said, he's moving on to the next chapter, as long as he's healthy, all of that. I think the reason why it is noteworthy is just, look, I mean, I think undoubtedly Fauci will be one of the most significant figures of our lifetime, really, whether we like it or not, in terms of impact on policy, initial pandemic response, and, I mean, in a lot of ways, responsible for some of the major dividing lines that we had in American society, many of the cleavages and more that have hardened both sides into where they are. I think the scars of COVID are going to be felt for many, many years, as much as everybody wants to move on. And one of the things that, you know, we wanted to do, and we did the same with the CDC, whenever the CDC announced, they're like, hey, by the way, we actually did screw up. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, you think? <laughs> um, yeah, really? Interesting. Amazing. It took you two years in order to figure that out. With Fauci, though, unfortunately, Crystal, he's basically just being, hey, geographically treated. Uh, we'll end this segment with an MSNBC on Rachel Maddow where they're like, why does everybody hate you? What's so wrong with you? You didn't do anything wrong. Uh, the reaction to this, even in the Times and elsewhere, is like he's some sort of major American hero. And so we, again, did the same thing that we did with the CDC. Put the vaccine question aside, of which there are, of course, many debates continue to be had. Just the pure pandemic response from the beginning, the lies, the manipula manipulation of the public, and perhaps one of the great scandals of all time, the cover-up of a very likely le leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, of which he was directly connected to. Let's take a listen to all of that. The one thing that's paramount here that we want to make sure that people don't all of a sudden go out, buy and hoard masks that are most appropriately used and necessary for the frontline healthcare workers who do need it for the clear and present danger that they find themselves in when they are taking care of people who are actually sick with coronavirus disease. We still don't know what the origin is, that if you look historically in the way things rolled out, we all felt, and, and still do, actually, Willie, that it is more likely to be a natural jumping of species from an animal reservoir to a human. However, since we don't know that for sure, that you've got to keep an open mind. I have never lied before the Congress, and I do not retract that statement. This paper that you are referring to was judged by qualified staff up and down the chain as not being gain of function. 
So what was, saying, let me take, finish. You take an animal virus and you increase its yeah, transmissibility yeah. to humans, right. you're saying that's not gain of function? Yeah, that is correct. And, and Senator Paul, you do not know what you are talking about, quite frankly. And I want to say that officially. You do not know what you are talking about. But if they get up and really aim their bullets at Tony Fauci, well, people could recognize there's a person there. So it's easy to criticize. But they're really criticizing science because I represent science. That's dangerous. And of course, I, that last one, I think, will always be his legacy in my mind, which is that he you know, basically aligned himself with, quote unquote, the definition of science. And unfortunately, actually politicized what science is, which is really just a scientific method. I always point to this, and so do you. Let's put this up there, which is that the straight up acknowledgement by Dr. Anthony Fauci at more than a year ago now at this point, in which he had basically admitted that he was fudging the numbers as to what level of herd immunity would be needed in order to, quote, go back to normal in order to try and manipulate public opinion. He said, well, when polls said only half of Americans would take a vaccine, I was saying herd immunity would take 70 to 75. Then when new survey said 60 percent would take it, I said, oh, I can nudge this up a bit. So I went to 80, 85. We need to have some humility here. Astonishing. We really don't know what the real number is. So just say that. Yeah, just be like, just I don't that. know. <laughs> don't be yeah. like, I told the American people what I thought they could handle at one time. Right. I do think that last saw we played with him yes. talking about how, you know, they're really attacking science because mm -hmm. that's what I represent. I am science. You know, it actually is very revealing because he did become this total lightning rod where Republicans wanted to make everything about him and he was evil incarnate and yeah. they're going to launch investigations and we're going to get into that. And Democrats wanted to worship him as a hero and they wanted to have their vote of candles and all around DC you would see these oh, yeah. signs like in praise Thank and you, worship Dr. of Dr. him. Yeah. And in fact, I mean, any sort of like hero worship or demonization of one person in particular, one very fallible human being who, as we document, made some very significant and very consequential mistakes, that is going to ultimately poison your public health response. It is ultimately going to make it very difficult to just assess the evidence as it is because people come become too wrapped up in just defending whatever it is that this person is saying or doing or attacking whatever it is that this person is saying or doing. We see this in our politics all the time. It's just another reflection of the intense partisanship with which, you know, DC elites and some core of the Republican base and the sort of Democratic liberal base with which they view politics. Everything is filtered through the lens of like, is this person a good person or an evil person? Then if they're on the good side, I'm going to just take whatever they say, no matter what it is, I'm going to justify it. I'm going to assume it's the truth. And if they're on the evil side, I'm going to do the polar opposite. He, during the coronavirus response, really became that sort of lightning rod figure. I mean, I will say, like, in terms of, you mentioned he was at the core of some of the, the politiz mm -hmm. politicization. I always have trouble saying that word. I mean, Donald Trump was by far the worst defender there when he's the president of the United States, and he's supposed to be at that time bringing people together and not, you know, going off on these crazy tangents as he did. So let's lay a lot of blame at his feet. But the inability for um, liberals to recognize some of the very crucial failures of Fauci on mass, on herd immunity, on the other things that we're talking about here, I think really hampered the response and was a sort of, it was an indication and at the center of how our coronavirus response became so partisan in a way that did not happen yes. in other countries. Like it wasn't, it didn't have to go this way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I completely agree. I mean, if you think back to the very beginning, there were a lot of, I mean, myself included, I was like, wow, you know, what often brings a great country together, which is in the middle of strife, is a major disaster and everybody can unite. And that lasted for like two weeks. And then look, I mean, no denying what Trump did in terms of what we're going to, the churches are going to be full by Easter. <laughs> that may continue to be one of the worst things yes. that he did or likening it to just the flu in the very beginning, not taking much of the response seriously. However, and this is the other uh, thing that you said, by the media playing actually into that dynamic and turning him essentially into a god for, let's say, millions of people, we never still to this day have an honest accounting 
of what happened at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Look, at this point, we have got reams of evidence in the lab leak direction, and we've got some very, very scant, very biased uh, studies that continue to come out that say, well, maybe it did come out of the Wuhan wet market, even though the Chinese government still does not stick to, and this is the key thing, still they do not even stick to the wet market theory. They're like, eh, it just kind of happened. By the way, let's all just move on. Let's not talk about that anymore. We could get into the details ad nauseum, but at a very basic level, they did implicate Dr. Anthony Fauci. And that's part of the reason why I have always looked at him as a real villain, because what he did was he was able to use his public position in order to cover up, again, one of the great scandals. And perhaps what's worse is that we have not done anything to rectify that situation. All of the talk about let's ban gain of function research, let's have an actual you know, discussion around when it's appropriate, when not, what are the guardrails, US guidelines, none of that happened. Instead, we ended up, as Josh Rogan has often pointed out, we ended up uh, actually okaying the tune of billions of dollars of new money in order to be spent on this. None of the public health figures who are involved uh, in gain of function, who you know paved the way for all of this, quote, scientific collaboration with the Wuhan lab, none of those people have ever been held to account. Peter Daszak, many of these, I mean, these are liars, absolute liars that should be held to account. That hasn't come, unfortunately, Crystal. Yeah, no, and I mean, I will say in terms of the Republicans yeah. like chomping at the bit for this investigation, which I totally support. Yes. And I would love to in a like actually fact finding type of way, which I'm not totally confident they'll be able to accomplish, but I would love to mm -hmm. get to the bottom of it. But I do also have to say, like the only thing we really know about what Republicans will do if they take power is which investigations they're gonna obsess over. Yes. You know, Hunter Biden and Tony Fauci. Fauci. Yeah. We know that's gonna be the focus of their efforts. Have they told us a single thing about what they would actually do about inflation or tax policy or ch children or educate? No, not really. They're, you know, very clear on who they want to go after and who they want to sort of demonize and continue to dig into. Not so clear on their agenda for the American people. Be that as it may, look, I 100% support getting to the bottom of what happened. I think Fauci was, this is one of the prime areas where he was extremely dishonest with the American people. He is implicated in some of the very early conversations in terms of trying to completely shut down any discussion and debate and inquiry into whether this was a possible plausible theory that caused, you know, the entire response and investigation to lose a lot of critical time and, you know, may ultimately lead to the fact that we never know definitively yes. what exactly happened here because so much time was ultimately lost. Yeah, I think that's right. And look, Fauci going out with a bang, uh, of course, on the Rachel, and this is what I love too, which is that of all the places for his last cable news interview, or the very first at least of the day after his announcement, where does he choose? The Rachel Maddow program with Rachel Maddow himself, in which he says that we're dealing with the distortion of reality as to why anybody does not like him. Let's take a listen to that. What we're dealing with now is just a, a, a distortion of reality, Rachel. I mean, conspiracy theories, which don't make any sense at all, pushing back on sound public health measures, you know, making it look like trying to save lives is encroaching on people's freedom. He'll never, he'll never learn. I just think it's too perfect. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.